This is my security detail in the front. <laughs> Some of us are less secure. Should I go? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to have a board of trustee elections during this meeting, and we're actually going to kind of keep it outside so the meeting can still go on. And at some time between now and 8.15, you'll have time. You can either all go at once or just wander out there when the line is short and get your official ballot. If you have voted online or by paper, we have your names. If there was some glitch and you're not sure, you can come out and check with us and make sure we have your your name. If you have not voted by yet, paper when there was no paper ballots oh. issued. Because we were um, trying to do, well, by, let's let John explain that. There were paper ballots, you had to go online and print them. Oh. Uh, so, yeah. But if you don't go online, there was down. no paper ballots. Right, you didn't get one mailed to you in the mail this year. We were going to try right. to go all electronic. That's uh, going to be a problem for those of us who do not want to go online. Right, so we'll work on that for next year. We're going to probably do Best. something else. Next year. Okay, so. It, it was announced last year. No, it wasn't. It's hard to do communication. Anyway, you will go get your ballot. We have four candidates this year for board, and we each collect three. So we would like you to circle up to three of the names, and then we would like you to turn your ballot in to one of the officials out there, and we will count it, hopefully, before the end of this meeting, and we'll be able to come back and give you the, the final result on the um, who was elected to the Board of Trustees. And we would like you to bring your NAR card out there so we can verify um, your membership. And if you don't have your NAR card, we can look you up in the database just to make sure that we, we have you. So we can check your number and check you out. Okay. Um, man, I'm not, I think I want to look you up if you don't have your NAR card, just to make sure. Okay, that's that's all I have to say. So anytime, I wouldn't all of you vote once, but whenever you're ready, just come out here. <laughs> we'll start in about 10 minutes. People 10 minutes! <laughs> that wants to vote, have you gone out? I think the resounding silence is, is ah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start the town hall meeting while they're tallying the votes and completing that process. Then when we're done with the town hall meeting, we'll bring Joyce and the, the vote tallyers back in. We'll do the quick NAR business meeting and, and wrap this up. And then post this meeting, Ed will present um, another update and um, tell people about the contest portion of things. So, if you don't know who I am, it's written on my shirt. I'm John Hockheimer, the president of the NAR, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about the, the state of the NAR. Other trustees who most are present, you all know Joyce, you spoke with her out there. Ryan Colvin, our vice president, has been unable to make the meeting today. Ryan, Joyce, Tom Ha, our treasurer, sitting back there with his Cool, um, Florida shorts on, so he's ready. Um, what else we got here? Ed LaCroix is poking around here. Carol is up helping uh, unwrap some. Uh, uh, Vince Hughley, I saw Vince. Vince is here. Um, John Lingdahl, and Mark is at the door. So those are your, your trustees as um, for the current term. All right. And um, I think Ted's, Ted or Trip or it's me, but we've been doing these safety minutes at the beginning of, of these meetings, and, and I think it's something that we really should continue. Um, and instead of highlighting just one thing, I, I tried to pull a, a couple things um, together here. And positioning people um, with respect to, to where our rockets are launching and, and um, landing it is extremely important. And I noticed. Saturday, we, we had to work on positioning. Um, one piece of that work on positioning is we actually um, taped off an area that now there's nobody parking, which gives us a huge safe landing zone if, if the wind's blowing away from the big icky. Um, so it's just doing things like this and, and just observing as we set up 
where are the crowds, where are the vehicles, where are people who don't know what's going on and, and may not be anticipating this big honking rocket coming down safely under parachute, hopefully um, on top of them. So we can reduce a lot of risk just by observing where things would go on the field. Angling rails away from the crowds, another thing. You know, create and force a splash zone that's away from somebody that, that's not going to be aware. Um, something that, that we've been um, actually working with, with Tripoli on, um, they feel that this is something that, that's extremely important, that they've had problems with their membership. But keeping spectators and non-essential personnel um, out of the launch area. When we're setting up that big level three rocket that's got complex electronics, that's not the place for the photo op with the two-year-old. Okay? Take it when it's inert and you're, you've put it and assembled it in the parking area, but out on the, the launch field, the people that are out at the, um, especially the high power range, need to be all situationally aware of what's going on. Okay, it's not the, the family gathering photo op place. And finally, it's fire season. And we've been reminded, I think a couple times over the past few days, and kudos to everybody here, everything's been handled wonderfully, right? You have tons of water out there. People are prepared and ready. Something bad happens. You know, there's an immediate response. And, you know, a small area is burned. Nothing significant um, happened, okay? So that's what preparedness, and, and that's what we hope um, keeps us safe. So prevent fires if, if at all possible and just plan for suppression. Alright, so sort of looking back over the, the past year, um, I guess I've, I've had the, the great fortune of inheriting a, a really strong National Association of Rocketry. Right? It's, um, the membership has been in excess of 6,000 since I um, became president, um, actually well in excess of 6,000, and currently we're at a little bit over 6,600 members. All right, it fluctuates, and if um, anybody's really interested, and I, I'm sure Ted and Tripp and, and others have shown in the past, if you look at week to week, um, right now our membership is at the all-time low for the month of, that will be for the month of August. We've just sort of purged the list of everybody with an expiring membership. And it'll just gradually grow up to the end of the month. The end of August, we'll do another purge of people who are whose membership has expired. It drops back down and works its way up. But if you look at the trend over time, we're actually gaining over time. So we've got 6,600 members strong, and, and that's great. And we can do a lot because we have a, a strong membership base now. We have 174 sections right now, one more than um, the town hall meeting that I did in um, at Narcon, at, and between Narcon and now we renewed sections. So there were uh, a number of sections that dropped out or probably weren't active at the time that I thought we had 173 sections. But currently we have 174 sections, 10 new ones, and two sections that restarted themselves um, from a dormant um, a period of dormancy. So our sections are strong. We'd like to see it get stronger, but we're, we're maintaining access to groups of people to launch rockets all across the United States. And um, he's not here, but kudos to Chuck Neff, who does uh, a, a ton of work associated with the sections. You know, Randy, by the way, in the, the section activities, Randy Gilbert also contributed, but Chuck down there in the trenches, we get somebody that requests some information about sections, Chuck's on them. He's, he's contacting them, he's sending them information, he's getting their, their section stuff posted up on the, the web, um, he, he's get them located on the map and the locator, he's just working constantly with them to help them grow their sections. Our financial position is extremely healthy. Um, if I can do the, the mental and visual math that I, um, and looking at our budget year over year, at this point in time, compared to this point in time last year, we're $75,000 ahead of where we were. Right? And our member, um, we're growing our membership, so the, the bulk of our income comes from our membership dues. So that steady increase, uh, along with a, a lot of spending that we've been trying to do to, to increase member services, um, we're still gaining ground on, on, in terms of our financial health. 
So that's, that's a really good, um, strong position. Um, Tom, our, our magazine, um, Todd, the, the, you know, our magazine continues to be the, the best ever. Yeah. How many people have seen the most recent issue? I mean, it's phenomenal stuff in there. I can't help it. I, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. So my three-year-old grandson is a member of the NAR, and it was um, somewhat by accident. Um, you know, eventually I was going to join him up as a member, but we had to test something out on the web page, and I had to do something to join a new member. And then I was just going to run my credit card through. I, it doesn't help me. I'm a life member, so I never get those renewals and, and do anything. So I said, wait a minute. I'll just sign Logan up. So put all Logan's information in, and um, I didn't totally blindside my daughter, so I called her up and said, hey, you know, Logan's going to start getting stuff now from the National Association of Rocketry. He's going to be a member and, and things. And, you know, his card shows up, the member guidebook shows up, the, the magazine shows up, and he's thrilled, and FaceTime's wonderful, and he calls me up and shows me all this stuff, and he's so proud that he has a member card. Um, and then since then, He's taking to whenever he gets the, the version of the, the magazine, he plops down on the kitchen table at breakfast time and eats his cereal and reads through the magazine. And so I get pictures of Logan Reed's magazine. So guys, you gotta you gotta captive audience in, in my um, my grandson. And you know and a captive audience in, in a bunch of others here. But anyways. Um, and finally our, our high power certification rate is has achieved record levels. We continue to grow with, with high power flyers. Some more great years. Our, our liability insurance remains at $5 million. Um, and part, um, I would say, we're able to achieve that because the student launch program contributes a significant amount. We, we jumped it from $2 million to $5 million at um, the request of them for the contract that we have with, with NASA. Um, so they, chip, they pitch in a little bit. But I would say also the fact that we've been safe over the past several years, our premiums have gone up, but not they've not gone up because we've had a, a poor safety record. So good insurance program. Um, we continue to make improvements to the website, and we're going to we've got some things underway that we're going to chip away at that even more and, and freshen it up more and, and put some additional content on. Um, we're going to give away thirty-five thousand dollars in grants and scholarships this year. So educationally, we're supporting things. We continue to have a, a robust section grants program. You know, how many people here are in, you know, you, you guys are all in sections, right? Has your section applied for and, and gotten a section grant this year? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, I read a lot of checks, but I don't write 174 of them. Um, let's see where else. And, and we're consistently delivering on our partnerships with key educational groups, um, AIA with, with TARP. Um, NASA with the student launch program. We, we're participating in other STEM programs, other educational programs as well. Joyce, Vince, um, some others are, are constantly improving the NAR education program in our website and the outreach that we do for education. So we're doing an awesome job with these. All right, so let's break it down a little bit more. So how are we doing? So our membership is growing. I told you about that. Um, we didn't have time to split this graph up, but and. I'm slightly colorblind, so this is either orange or pink, but this top line, um, and when my wife's really mad at me, she doesn't tell me what color I have on. Um, but the top line is, is our, our membership growth. This was our, our peak month in October of 2016. I'm hoping to greatly exceed that this October. But here we are about between $6,600 and $6,700, or 100 members. You know, steady, constant growth <coughs> membership. If we break it down, five, um, roughly 5,000 senior members, 8,600 leader members, almost 600 junior members, 35 or so life members. Um, and the, the one thing that I, I've, the, our um, management system allows me to pull lots of data, and, and I've, I've been playing around with it more and more, and I can actually have it tell me week to week over the course of a year, whatever time period you want, you know, what the membership um, levels are and how many new members we get, how many members leave the organization. And I've looked at it over the past 18 months to two years, and we're growing at about 25 members per month. All right, so at, at the end of a month, we'll lose a couple hundred to, um, depending on the month, 
Several hundred members will drop off because they, they need to um, renew. Um, the majority of them renew, but we're, we're actually exceeding that in the, the balance of things. We're growing at about 25 members a month. Pretty good. Um, highest level this year so far has been 66.85. So and that was, I think, in April. All right, if we look at our finances, um, we're continuing healthy finances. At this membership level, we're bringing in roughly $480,000 to $500,000 in, in revenue. And, and again, our membership is the, the biggest contributor to that. Um, our annual budget is about $350,000. Right? So we're committed to, and we remain committed to providing service for members. We spent a lot of time at the board meeting trying to figure out what can we do differently to enhance the member membership experience. And, and I'm going to tell you about a, a couple of them. But um, and, and we're also you know, trying new things. We're, we're trying to get rid of things that, that haven't worked. Um, so we're, we're constantly as a board trying to figure out how can we keep on doing things better. Um, so I don't know why I put this so low, but um, the bottom line, the blue, I, I know what that color is, is our funds <laughs> account. And that fluctuates across the year as well. These big dips tend to be when we, we write that $70,000 plus dollar check to the insurance company that occurs at every um, March, April time frame. Okay? But year over year, we're maintaining. Hi. Um, where does our money go? This used to be a pie chart. I had the hardest time to kind of deal with it, and I didn't think it was real. And I, I like numbers better. And sort of, I'll put numbers in a pie chart maybe next time. But if we break down our income, dues is about 72%. STEM, um, the student launch NASA contract that we have actually constitutes about 13% of our budget right now. Um, the magazine with ad sales is about 7%, just pure donations. Um, and we actually get a lot of people that sort of round up their membership numbers and, and donate some money that way. Mm -hmm. um, NARS is about 2%, and then just miscellaneous stuff that um, didn't fit any of those categories is about 2%. Um, and unless my calculator was wrong this morning, that should add, add up to 100. I had to fix that. So. Um, and where, where do our expenses go? The magazine is the <laughs> most expensive thing that we have, about 35%. Insurance, 14%. Um, the student launch. Um, program actually is a net. Um, whatever we take in from the student launch, we actually disperse back out with that contract. Um, that's 14% of, of our expenses. Headquarters services, Marie, that's 12%. Our national events program like this is 11% of our um, expenses. Educational grants at $35,000 plus some other things we do in education. It's about six miscellaneous for member services. Um, that in particular, I think, is the, the membership, the fulfillment that we do with your card. So the company that we pay to send out the cards and do all that is, is a big chunk of that member services. Okay. We're also very diverse, and, and, and mostly diversity in, in age at this point, but our median age is still around 51, and the mean age is about 45. Um, I think I, I may have said this earlier at, at, at Narcon, but I used to be sort of proud and then um, the older I got, then the, the more scared I got about it. But I used to be in median age. Every year when the median age changed, as I got one year older, the median age changed older. Well, that's dropped now nine years. So, <laughs> um, so we're getting younger, which, which is good. And, and it's a, a very much of a bimetal distribution. That TARC contribution in terms of our membership is very significant at that 16 to 21 your um, age group. Um, high power flyers, um, it continues to to grow. We have roughly 3,500 of our members are high power certified. That's a little bit over 52% of our membership. 158 of those are junior members. Year over year, we lost 50 in the junior membership, but the best I can tell is they graduated out of the junior membership in, into um, <coughs> regular senior level one, which means we're not um, replacing them on the low end. So that may be something we want to look at. Level one, about 1,500. Level two, about 1,300. 
and about 500 level three. Those, all three categories have grown um, over the past year. We have about 450 teachers or so by, by my count. And people who self-identify themselves as being a part of a section is about 3,700 members. Um, I think that's low in our database. I think there's a lot of people, um, I think like in NOVAR, that we probably have members of NOVAR who don't identify themselves in our database as being affiliated with the section, so we're just not capturing um, all the section members. Um, so we'll keep trying and, and keep trying to capture as many, but also keep encouraging people. So what are our priorities? First and foremost, safety. Safety is what keeps us being able to do a lot of what we want to do in terms, in terms of the sport. Uh, we want to continue to support all forms of commercial um, sport rocketry, and by that I mean you know, using commercially available motors. Um, we want to continue to support education outreach. We are a 501c3 organization founded to do educational um, advancement, and we want to continue with that mission. Um, teacher certification stuff, developing educational materials, the grants, the scholarships, whatever we can do in terms of um, education and outreach. I mean, TARC is 15 years old and, and remains going strong. We had, what, more teams this year, or was this the second highest year since? It's the highest since the first year. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so TARC, and um, I, I joked with Tripp at, at TARC this year that hopefully 15 years from now, him and I will still be up on the stage at, at, the, at the TARC finals. With crutches. Get out of my way, Tripp. No. Um, so, um, so some more priorities. Um, I want to continue to strive to grow our membership. And my, my goal with, over the next year and actually, the next six months is I want to hit 7,000. You know, can we hit that 7,000 mark? And then, then we'll figure out a new goal. Um, we want to offer members full transparency in, in what we do and, and, and the opportunity to participate. This is, is one of those forums. Um, our meetings are open except for the executive session of the board. And I hope that we're responding to and, and to questions and providing feedback. Um, some may not feel that we're, we're always that way, but um, let us know and we'll continue. We'll, continue to try to improve. Um, and we want to continue to provide support to our level sections in the forms of grants and if there's other things that sections need that, that we can provide that we want to try to do it. Okay, so the board met yesterday and um, we had a, a busy day and um, kept people corralled in the room um, for as, as, as long as possible. And, and I think we had a, a, a very fruitful meeting. We got a lot accomplished. And um, the things that we, we accomplished, the, sort of the highlights of that are included, we accepted and approved the budget for 2017, a little bit late, but we, we got it, we're, we're, we're right on task with our budget in terms of spending, um, you know, everything is going fine with that. Um, we talked about and we decided to establish a finance committee um, that reports to the board. And then the finance committee is gonna provide oversight and strategic planning. Right? Um, and hopefully one of the areas that, that we can, um, the finance committee can help us with is um, help us in the budget forecast and, and um, the budgeting process. You know, what are we doing now? Do we want to start looking more into the future and how do we get to the future based on our current um, financial situation? What do we need to change? Um, you know, like I said, we're bringing in close to $500,000 a year in, in, in monies now. You know, we may, I think, want to consider being audited and, and going through a process like that to, to show even more accountability to ourselves and to people that are contributing to us. Um, so, so this finance committee hopefully will help us along that pathway. Um, we're going to actually hire an accounting firm, and this this only costs us. Um, about ten thousand, or yeah, ten thousand dollars a year, um, to handle stuff like bookkeeping and IRS, IRS forms. Um, as we've grown, the number of little bills and little things, and and keeping our checking accounts and everything all straight, is becoming more and more of a burden to the treasurer. He's spending all his time um, dealing with the bookkeeping aspects aspects of things and we're not spending time doing the long-range budgeting and, and the thing that we really need the treasurer to do in, in terms of helping with the finances for the organization. 
Um, so it turns out that the size of our organization and the amount of work that we do is actually not that difficult for a bookkeeping firm. And so we found some um, firms that can do this. Um, we're going to work with them. They can handle that day-to-day -day kind of stuff pretty easily, free up Tom and, and the treasurer from doing that. Um, and as importantly, um, keep, up, keep us really on the cutting edge of keeping our IRS forms um, just going smoothly. Um, we have to, we're at this, the level now that we have to submit an annually a Form 990 to the IRS, which discloses all the financial um, doings because of a nonprofit like ours. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of work. I mean, Tom, what do you spend? 40, 50, 60 hours a, a, a year putting this Form 990 together. An accounting firm, they do these things all the time. It's like boom, boom, boom. If they're doing our books, they can just wrap that into the Form 990 and, and get it off. Um, and I'll tell you, the, the one accountant that's a, a really good friend of mine who does a lot of nonprofit work um, told me, that's not something you want to mess with. Okay? If we lose our 990, if we screw up with the 990 and lose our um, 501c3 status, it takes a long time to get back up to it. So, so we think that this is a very wise allocation um, of our uh, finances. Um, we're also adding some additional travel reimbursement for the board members and the president. And um, you know, maybe it may be viewed as self-serving, but you know, our, our expenses as board members continue to increase. And um, we just feel that if, it, if you have to be, um, use a lot of your personal finances to be a board member, that that may be a chilling effect on, on keeping board members. We have enough money to um, add some additional money to send our board members to our board meetings and so they're not out of pocket for the entire expense. So that's what we did. We changed the allocation from $500 to $1,000 per board member. Um, and then the other um, ex or disbursement that we agreed to is we're going to do a subscription for professional photo storage. We're taking lots and lots more pictures. And I'm going to have to, could you give me a favor, Mark, and give me a glass of water? <laughs> um, yeah. One of the marks. Um, but um, we're, we're taking lots of photographs, and, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to share them among the people that need to, to share them directly. So this photo storage allows us to do that a lot easier and a lot more uh, efficiently. Um, some other stuff we did. Um, I'll talk about this in a second, but um, we also voted to support the preservation of historic artifacts. Um, right now, it, that entails supporting the, the preservation of the Stein collection. Hold that thought. I'm pretty sure I have another slide. If not, I'll, I'll do it from memory. But um, that involved some actions that, that we want to work with the museum with. Like, thank you very much, Mark. Um, in, in terms of preserving that, that wealth of um, history for our organization and for our hobby. Um, we're going to support travel for the NAR headquarters, the NAR historian to travel to NAR headquarters. There's some information that Jennifer needs from Marie, and at the same time, Marie's not been updated in terms of technology probably for three or four years now, and um, Marie tends to use things until they fall apart, and I'm sure there's a, like a lot of duct tape and stuff holding that. Um, 1980s vintage computer together in her little cubby downstairs. But so we're going to just take a look and see what she needs, and if, if she needs any refresh in some of her technology, we'll take care of that too as well. Yes. A uh, final reminder: if there are any eligible voters who have not voted yet, you have five minutes. I don't think that's anybody in the room, but I want to afford everybody every possible opportunity. We're, we're tracking that. All right, so we also reviewed the um, RC Rocket Glider Safety Code. Um, we took a look at it as part of several safety things that we've been looking at as a board and, and as our safety committee with, with Steve Lobliner. Um Steve took a look at the current safety code, and um, we're thinking we may not want to call it a safety code, but a safety best practices. You know, it could be a lot of hand waving, but what we feel as a board that we want to signal to people if they want to fly RC rocket gliders that 
here's some best practices that you could use that will lead towards you having a, a safe operation. Um, and I think for the most part, they're not largely different. In, they're not going to be largely different than the recommendations that your committee comes up with that they are now. Um, Steve also did some work on some high power contest guidelines that, that I thought were pretty interesting. And it, he did some of those last year in um, St. Louis, and I think some of them are going on this year. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we could do in high power flying to do some just some fun and unique contests. So Steve's going to be working on that. We sent those both to, to committees to work on. Um, and it comes up every now and then. I've been on the board eight or nine years, I don't know, a while now. Um, but every once in a while somebody pops up that, you know, should we do develop a safety code for water rockets? And um, I think the last time it was brought to the board, we considered it and thought, you know, there are some good points that we could do with that, and then there's some potential disadvantages. Um, in the end, the board still feels that, um, you know, we're not going to support a safety code from, for water rockets. That's just outside of the scope of what we're doing, right? Um, it would be great that somebody does it, but it's, you know, we've got enough things to, to deal with right now, and that's just uh, a little bit out of the scope, and we're not sure we want to take on the burden associated with, with that. Okay, so what are, what are some of the things that we've been doing as well? So we renewed our insurance. I paid $77,000 to the insurance company for a great insurance policy. Um, we've done section grants. There's still funding available. I think I'll show you later, but there's... We've written a considerable amount of checks for section grants, but there's a bunch of money left in that pot. Um, we've increased our social media presence on Facebook and Twitter. Um, Carol Markle, um, Mark Wise, and our other members are, are, are actively on Facebook trying to, to keep our presence up in there. We continue to grow our Facebook presence um, in social media, and Carol's coming with some additional things that we can do to try to en enhance our presence in, in the social media realm, which we think will continue to help us grow. John, we're also on Instagram, and YouTube is coming. Ah, okay. Uh, I did this at like 6 o'clock this morning, so I think I'm mainly, but yeah. So we are also on Instagram. Um, competition, we've, we've completed the sporting code that includes skills, craftsmanship, and, and R&D rules. Um, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, you know, it's still not wholly popular among all our membership. Um, these guys have done a, a, an awesome job in, in my view. They spent a lot of hours and a lot of time pulling together um, a revision of the safety code. And following this meeting, um, they're going to, um, Ed's going to present uh, an, another update for the group and those who are interested in, in reviewing it. Um, we also signed a, an MOU with the Air Force Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps. I'll say that five times fast. Um, and it's similar to, I think we have one with the Civil Air Patrol, we have one with um, 4-H. And um, we just view this as a way to potentially um, interface with other youth groups that um, have rocketry programs as, as part of their overall mission. and. Um, you know, it just may be another source of some new membership, and, and it's another way for us to get the educational um, programs out that, that we're trying to promote. Okay, I told you to talk about the Historic Preservation Fund. All right. Um, at the last board meeting, we created a Historic Preservation Fund um, within the NAR, and essentially that created um, I like to think of things in buckets. Um, you know, we have this bucket to do this thing, but um, it allows us to have a mechanism that we can do fundraising to help preserve historic artifacts and things that we think are historically important to our hobby and to the NAR. Right? So, um, analogous to the Cannon Fund. So now we have a place within our um, financial system that we could put money that would could be earmarked to go to <coughs> historic preservation. So that's what that fund was. Um, as part of that, Pat Fitzpatrick um, has been very active. Um, Pat, um, I want to be a pilot. Do you guys have like a lot of free time? <laughs> Either he has a lot of free time or he just like never sleeps. But you know, all these emails and all these ideas from Pat, and, and ah, okay, Pat. Mm -hmm. 
work with them closely. But Pat's come up with a lot of ideas, and, and Pat's really spearheading um, a way to help populate this preservation fund. And he's looking at you know talking to some members to, to donate to the preservation. He's looking at talking to um, some corporate sponsorship and, and all sorts of levels in between, right? And th then they're looking for different ideas to sh sort of show your participation and, and show um, you know that we appreciate that people are um, contributing to this fund. So things like pins and. Um, the, the artwork that's on display up here, and feel free to come up and, and take a look at it um, after the meeting, but these are examples of some artwork that could be used as um, a, a, a thank you to some, some large donors in, in terms of contributing to the fund. And, um, and I continue to look at these and just sort of hope that in Pat's packing, he's just <laughs> Distracted a little bit, <laughs> one of them just sort of falls into the bag that's over there. My so, so the sheet over here. Yep, and, and we'll pass it around. But if, if people are interested in in more information about these, and, and feel free to come up and look at. It. But I'll pass the sign up sheet around, and um, you know, let us know that you're interested, and Pat will be um, sending you some information and and bending your ear a little bit. So one of the things that's come up. In terms of this preservation, you know, y'all know that we're, we're affiliated and, and uh, affiliated. We, we've established a partnership and a working relationship with the Museum of Flight in Seattle, and as a result of that, there's a display at the Museum of Flight in Seattle of, of rocketry, um, historical artifacts. So, Chip, is one of your models in there? Do you have anything on the display? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the rockets that won each of the last two years at Park are always on display here, for one thing. Okay. Um, when Melissa sent one of her gliders? Yeah, several of the uh, FAI US team rockets that have won gold medals are on display here, too. Yeah. So, um, it's it's a really, the whole museum is, is awesome, in, in particular the, the rocket you display. But um, in addition to those kind of displays, um, the Stein collection is largely now located at the Museum of Flight. All right, and um, I didn't have time, and, and I don't want to take all your time, but um, Pat showed us some. You know, there's pallets of shrink wrap stuff waiting to be archived and gone through, and, and um, I don't know what I, I'm not a curated. Curated. Um, yeah, there's a word for it. Um, at the Museum of Flight to, with, with the Stein Collection. And one of the things the Museum of Flight and you know, we think should happen is that this thing does need to be curated. Mm -hmm. Now what does that mean? So they're going to go through and index it all and see what do we really have. Now, right now they just have pallets of the boxes. And they've gone through some of it and, oh, you know, we got the, this. I wasn't around for Harry Stein, so I don't know any of think of significant. but. In some of the pictures I've seen, there's some really cool models that I'm sure were part of Harry's company and some of the stuff he flew, but there's just lots and lots of paper and plans and things, and we, we need to go through it. And we can make it available, and the museum can make it available for people electronically online to see what's there, and, and if there's a plan for, I don't know, um, what's up? Veronique. A, a what? Veronique. Veronique. Um, you, you can go online and search it and get an electronic uh, version of, the, of that thing. So that, that's sort of what the curation process is supposed to do. So what's it going to take to do that? They're estimating right now about $100,000. So and what the Museum of Flight is looking for is they'll match from donations on their side, $50,000 match from the NAR. To start that process, we set aside, but not, we didn't give them money yet. We set aside $25,000 in this, the beginning of the process to support that effort. So we, we've created in our banking account now a temporarily restricted fund. See, Tom's teaching me, it took me a while. Um, we, we created that fund, and money's still in our bank account, but we just earmarked it now as funds that the board 
things we could set aside to support this effort. Right? The thing's not going to happen until all the money's available. So we're fundraising, we're looking to you for support, we're looking to lots of others for support. Um, but we think that this is something that's very, very worthwhile. The, the history of model rocketry is largely sitting at the Museum of Flight, ready to be processed. Okay, so that's what... Um, and the bottom line on this, we want feedback from the membership. Right? Send me a note. Um, you know, talk among yourselves. Uh, I don't think I have time to talk an hour to each one of the people in the room. I, mean, I may. I, I don't sleep as much as, as most. Um, but I'm here all week. Uh, I'm, I'm open to ideas and, and want to hear from you. Um, and we're going to try to survey membership and, and get this out there. But we want to know what you all think about this as well. Okay? Did I hit it? It can benefit everybody. Yeah. I think it's cool. I don't know. All right, so what's still happening in the NAR? Well, we're still paying up to $350 for articles, and um, Tom assures me that all you budding young writers and rocketry enthusiasts and people who have very cool stuff to share um, need to send him articles, and, and, um, and we'll work with you to get them ready and, and get them in the magazine. Um, we're recognizing high power skills with the Rocket Science Achievement Award still. Um, we still have a recruitment bonus that's next on my list to um, get that big stack of $5 bills and, and send out. Um, we're still looking at um, motors and, and what we do with motors. We have the expired motor testing program that still exists and I think recently somebody asked to do that and, and we worked out the logistics for them. And somebody in like Tennessee or South Carolina or something. I get about typically about one or two requests a month. Yeah, so people are still um, participating in that, and <coughs> MotorCato.org is still up and available when we have um, um, significant problems, you know, Cato's with motors. And our Facebook page, I looked it up this morning. It may, it may have changed, but we have 5,585 members on our Facebook page as of sometime this morning. All right, um, contest rocketry, the expanding competition subcommittee that Ed LaCroix has is, is been heading himself, um, Scott Alexander, Glenn Fevier, Jim Filler, Chad Ring. Ed, Scott, and Chad are all somewhere here, two out of the three. I don't see Chad in physically. He'll be here. Yeah. But, um, but you know, a lot of this group is here. And um, they spent many, many hours working on this. And this has been a, a really, really hard working group. So um, I want to continue to commend them in, in what they've been doing with, with um, their, their subcommittee. Um, Bob Olway, I, I want to also commend you. Um, you, you, you. Kudos to you in embracing the, the concept of a rocketry festival. All right? I, I love it. I, I, I got the materials, and I'm looking through all the information. And we have a, what was that, a rocketry carnival? Yeah. Yeah. Carnival launch. Carnival launch. It, you know, I got a, it was, uh, I'm sorry I was at the board meeting and I had to fly by proxy, but I really do appreciate, and the, the young lady at the place that we went to dinner last night really appreciated the, the prize I got from that, and she was actually pleasantly delighted to get the rocket and thought it was really cool. So, um, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think. Your imagination celebration, I heard that's going on. You had a night launch. Um, my gosh, I'm like drawing a blank. But there's so many things that, that you guys are, are trying to put out there for the membership. And one thing I would ask after you um, sleep for a week or two at the end of this, um, don't sleep too long, but get together and put down some of those ideas and, and what went right and what went wrong with them and send it to us. All right? We'll try to grow that information and send it to some, some other people. I, I think this, you know, we just got to keep generating the ideas. All right. Um, I have no idea where I'm at. And, well, that's okay. I'll, um, I, have to, I can't do my meds and math. It's been a long day. 
Um, okay, we have no insurance claims in 2016, and as of today, 2017, we've had no claims. We've had some incidents, and we've had some things that um, people have sent us the, the start of claims, and um, but nothing has occurred that's caused us to have it either the NAR to pay out any form of a deductible or we have to tap into the insurance company. Right? That's great. But there's still rockets at times that are flown and shouldn't be flown. You know, a near miss is not a good thing. Um, and I want to continue to emphasize to people that our insurance rate in $77,000 a year is a lot of money, but it, it could and can be a lot worse and a lot higher which will affect the financial health of this organization if we have a significant major impact that we have to pay out an insurance claim. All right? And minor accidents and minor incidents are happening all the time. And who's the lead negotiator for that? Who's the, um, our insurance agent? Yeah, next, next time you get me involved and next time you do that, I want to be able to help. Okay. Um, okay. Um, some other concerns, uh, other things that are on the, the top of our agenda. Um, we want to continue to attract and retain new members. You know, uh, we're growing and we continue to grow. We, we want to keep that trend moving upwards. Um, launch sites. We always need new launch sites. I, I wish I had the, the magic bullet and I, w I wish I could go and take the funds that we have available and buy one, two, five, ten, whatever number of launch sites across the United States. Um, I don't think that's financially possible at this point in time, but you know, we need to keep them, we need to cherish them, we need to continue to try to get new launch sites. It takes a lot of work, right? It's not you get a knock on somebody's door, hey, you got a nice big field out there, can we fly our rockets? If you can achieve that, you know, more power to you. But it takes a lot of work to get you know, more work than it takes to build a level three rocket. It's gonna take you to get new launch sites. Right? So we have to be willing to work hard at it. And we have to be willing to work smart at it. You know, yes, the NAR can give you some information, but the people that are local, you know, you have to interface with your neighbors and the people around you. They they're not gonna they don't want to talk to John Hawkeye from Alexandria, Virginia, if you're in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, you know, they want to talk to you all. You're the people that they're going to interface with, not me. Okay? So, if, if you guys have ideas that we can help you with, by all means, let us know. But, you know, cherish your launch sites, keep working hard to get new ones, and let us help you as best we can. But it's work that you guys have to do. We can, we can use more sections. You know, there's still spots in the country that don't have sections. We have a couple sections in Alaska now. That's great. Man, these guys band I don't know how they do it. I don't know if they have like flip planes or whatever that they travel around on, but but there's more than five people that band it together in somewhere Alaska. Um, so we, we need to continue to um, keep our sections active. And, and we need more volunteers to do things to improve our services, locally and, and nationally. Right? We have one paid employee right now. That's it. One paid person. Everybody else in this organization that's doing stuff is, is a volunteer. Now we're, we're starting to, to realize that we've grown big enough that we may have to start paying a few more things for services to keep our, our things going because the volunteer core that we have just isn't, you know, some of these things are just full-time jobs so we need to start paying for some of these services but, you know, we still, there's lots of things that volunteers can do and that, that we need help with. All right, so it's, I think I'm almost done. Um, so what's our value? At, um, we pay still $62 a year. I, I became a life member pretty quickly because I just kept forgetting to renew and it was just easier to send a check and be done with it. Um, but $62 a year, it hasn't changed in a long time, has it? 10 years. 10 years, okay. So it's, we're not increasing our cost with, or our dues with inflation. $25 for age 25 and under. Um, it's a great value. You get the magazine, you get $5 million worth of insurance. It includes fire insurance. Um, we have high power certifications through level three. You can do 
in country, locally, nationally, international competitions, and we have a, a family member discount, so we'll even take more off of, of your bill. Um, what can you do? I fly safe. I can't overemphasize it enough. Fly safely. The, the, the one bad accident is going to be really, really detrimental. Right, recruit new, new NAR members. Um, get more people to fly. Um, we had, it may just be second nature to me, but you know, I got here on Saturday. And there's a family and, and the father and the mother with the little baby and three little kids. And, they're, and the kids are just in awe. And, and I said, oh, you know, did you come to fly? And, and um, the father, well, we just came to watch. And, and I looked at the kids and they're like, yeah, we just came to watch. And I said, you don't have to watch. You can fly rockets right now today. We will give you rockets. And the, the Haas had the, the take it and fly it program. And those kids flew right. And I just happened to see them afterwards. And, and the father was like, yeah, they flew rockets. And I'm thinking, yeah, you're in trouble now. <laughs> So, yeah, but that's all it takes. I mean, we have the, 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 I, I happen to be in the Novar section, and we have a, a big section, you know, so we get, and we get lots of people coming in, but we get people like that too, and they come around, you know, and, you know, oh, I'm just here to watch, and I'm like, ah, no, you don't have to watch, you can fly a rocket, and we find rockets and, and help them fly. Um, take turns volunteering. We, we've got jobs that, that people can do. Um, do some community outreach. Um, I almost forgot to tell you guys. Community outreach, okay? Tomorrow morning, no. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, yes. Yeah. I forgot. So tomorrow morning, Ed LaCroix and myself, our golden voices are gonna be on NPR in, in your local area at 10.30. So I don't even know what the station is, but 10.30 tomorrow morning, you get to hear Ed and John, the Ed and John show, or the John and Ed show, or, you know, they don't know what's coming from. Yes. Does that occur nationally or locally? I've been trying to get the local station. 88.5. No, I, mean, I mean, was it submitted at a national level, on a local level? Because I've been sending stuff to NPR here, and they just put it in response. It's coming through the local... NPR. And it's the local NPR, and Machine it's... Machine radio. Machine uh, radio. Okay. Okay. And the, the reason that we're, we've been asked and we're involved in this is the City of Grand Rapids and the Convention and Visitors Bureau think this is a cool thing, and they want to... They're helping us promote it. They want to promote themselves. Um, so they have people that work for them that deal with the media. And those people contacted us. And they want us to, to be on the radio. And even better than that, Thursday morning, we're going to be on Fox TV three times, 6.30, 7.30, and 8.30. We're going to be out on, on, on the, your local TV station. Is Randy going to be with you? Randy. I don't know. I have to Take talk a to him. Yeah, he's the best guy I've ever seen. Oh, <laughs> uh, you haven't seen me. Yes. <laughs> you know what? This is the show stateside. If it's yeah, the show you're going to be on is it stateside tomorrow. Yeah. I don't know. I, I honestly, like, I think the the program is really the, the this program of of right. He doesn't the stuff the is really good, but. They're not giving me a whole bunch of information. <laughs> so all I know is I'm supposed to be there at 10 15 and 10 30 is when we go on the air. Still so so, live? I think it's live, yeah, so I have to be really careful. 10 30 is in the middle of a yeah. national program. Okay. Uh, uh, they may be taping it for, for broadcast. The, okay. There's a, a, a stateside program that airs at 3 o'clock uh, in the afternoon of 4. Do, do you have some of those, those the local? Uh, details on the local pumps and the like that would be useful if they get questions or anything um, or to build membership. Um, I, I, I don't think I saw the the questions they're asking us, and it's not too much of that. But I will continue looping to some of the local people. But, um, the, the question the NPR show is they just want to know about rocketry. All right, so we're going to do some community outreach, and it'll be fine. And then, then they're also making, um, I think part of tomorrow after we do the radio thing, um, they've also been taking, they said they've been taking some video, and they, they want to do some interviews with some different people. Um, the Convention and Visitors Bureau is producing like a two-minute video spot that they'll then give to, to us um, for, for our use. So um, that'll come out of th this week as well. So. Yeah, so cool free advertising. Um, 
Okay, so do, do outreach. Uh, make sure everyone knows and takes advantage of our scholarships and grants. Um, Joyce and Mark and a whole bunch of people have been um, pouring through lots of grant applications and scholarship applications. Um, and we got $35,000 more that I think I'm gonna have to write a whole bunch of checks coming up pretty soon for scholarships and grants. And above all, be safe, have fun, pay forward, and um, inspire your future and our future. I think that's it. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, just using your very own statistics uh, on voting, with your having 5,500 uh, Facebook members and the total membership being 6,600, you have disenfranchised for voting on the board members 1,100 people. Uh, why are you going and disenfranchising members of this uh, organization? I don't, understand, don't totally understand your question, but it's, well, you're, there are people you're not that are allowing on us to be heard. You're not allowing us to be uh, communicate what we feel. You're shutting down the membership. You are not okay. allowing us to communicate, even though you keep saying you want to listen to us and hear what we have to say. What you do is, in actual fact is shut us up. Well, um, I apologize and I'm sorry you feel that way, that it's not our intention. I'm um, not the only ones. There are people back, friends of ours back in Kansas who are not here, who did not get to vote on trustees membership because you did not do mailings and there, uh, you would not allow them to get on to the communication board to go and talk about the SQS. You went and left and would shut us up so that we could not go and communicate anything because you had a moderator on the SQS board who would not let us go and say anything that we had opinions about what was going on with SQS. You were shut us out. Again, I apologize that we did. We will continue to strive to do additional things to do that. We have we know that the voting is down this year and, and we're going to look into ways the, the people that handle the voting parts of the organization are going to look into ways of increasing voter participation and we're trying some new things some things work really well so apparently at least in your opinion this didn't work as well so it wasn't just start. me it was all in voting it in was your also with sqs we okay. were not allowed to be ta uh, allowed to communicate what our opinions were and a, a voice things about SQS either. We were shut out of that also because of the moderator. Oh, and my email box continues to be open and you communicated some of this to me and we're talking about it now. So you know, we'll continue to do as best we can. That's all, that's all I can I'm offer sure. money. But you aren't listening. We cannot communicate. We weren't allowed to talk about SQS. Why were you know this was you're not wanted you're shut out you what you're having to say isn't important I can I can talk to Bonnie if you want but yeah you didn't <coughs> want to talk to me Ed I sure well, that's you we tried to talk to you last year Ed and you shut us out. I you never wouldn't let us post out. anything. I never shut anyone out. Yes, you did. No, you I'm sorry. The, the page that was put up for members to comment with regards to what was known at that time as the SQS stated right up front that all comments were to include proposals and suggestions for changes. Correct. When Mark sent in his two comments, one regarding Super Rock, mm -hmm. the other one regarding, what was the second one regarding? Because I reviewed them both. I emailed them back to you and I said, Mark, you made good recommendations. However, you didn't propose to us what you would like to see us change. Please resubmit with a proposal for change. You did not resubmit. That's not closing him out. That's we simply holding that. him. No that is we simply did. holding him to, the, to what we said right up front for participation in that comment form. And that said, this is not a, this is not crock. This is not a discussion group. This is a tell us 
what you want us to do to make the rule book better. And those who submitted on those terms, or those who made an opinion statement, and I responded back and said, good point, but what would you like us to do to consider to change or improve? They were all asked to always resubmit, even verbatim what they originally said, just say, Mark could have said, oh, I know what the super act was about, total impulse. He could have just come back and said, I'd like to see total, uh, super rock total impulse limited to 10 newton seconds. That was something that we could have discussed and was an action you item. You did not give that specifics. You yes, went, I have the email copies did. with me. You can read them. Don't. You can read them, Bonnie. I have them in my bag here. Then why are you saying we did not resubmit when we resubmitted stuff? You, you did. did. Bonnie, did. I'm sorry, Bonnie. We have known yes. each other a good many years. <laughs> Uh -huh. and, and we're not and being listened to. Okay, all right. I'm so sorry if you we'll feel that way. To try to improve our communication. So I got a question, Fred, then. Uh, if something was submitted with a proposal, yes. what happened beyond that point? Because I, I, I did one of those where it said, hey, you know, here's something, and I, I just would never hear anything ever again. I mean, was that just like discussed and then dropped, or was it discussed? Because I, I don't think there was any. I mean, if there was a feedback for it was wrong, was there a feedback for it was right? You know what I mean? I think I know what you. I, I know what you mean. Anything we received that was a, I'd like to see that I would. I, if the, there was a proposal to amend, change, or alter what we already had put out there for member uh, consideration, we then used that input and to make change as long as it fit the requirements of our mission well, statements, That's our requirements of the mission statement, which is to expand right. competition. So you, the main point is that it, there was no discussion. You're right. There was not a discussion board, a, a discussion issue, and when you forum. And I think right. that's what a lot of people are wondering is that the discussion seems to have been about eight people, and there might have been input, but the input just you know went off in the air, and there was not really, you know, it's like, well, gee, you guys, eight, you eight people, really have a good idea, but what about the, you know, there seems to be a big current here. And it just seems like it. It's Again, a very interesting situation. I can only say that the opening statement to that comment forum simply said this this was an area for direct input to the sporting code that we were working on yeah. and that we wanted your input, right. suggested changes, and that it wasn't a place for discussion. It wasn't make a comment in order to generate more commentary. Yeah, I understand that. I'm saying, where's the discussion? There's 5,000 members and the, 500 people. The, 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 the discussion that you're generating is amongst the five of us on the committee to consider your proposal for change relative to the rules that we had presented. And if it, if it met the, what we considered the goal of trying to expand competition, then your then the result of your comment was included okay. in the change. So eight people, can change, eight people can change the entire course of contest rockery. Is that what you're saying? I eight. think that I think the confusion point. here is you guys wanted input on what you were doing, but anybody who had input that wasn't covered by what you were doing had no avenue of discussion. Exactly. exactly. I, Meaning it was a preordained thing. Right. This is what we're doing. There's other there's, forums that people can I think that's what they're getting at. There what, was no other What, forum. Contest Rock? You want us all to bitch like people? I mean, where is the discussion of the change of Contest Rocketry? And, and you guys look at us like we're, we have, like, deer in the headlights. We're changing Contest Rocketry, and you aren't listening to us. Nothing is being accepted or understood or even debated about, gee, explain to us why we're wrong. But we have all these questions. And there's just no answer. It's very strange. Um, I, I'll have to there close any, this by okay. saying okay, this. See, and here's the town hall meeting once a year. And once again, we're not talking about it. And I'm done. OK, thanks. That's it. Matt Johnson's done. Fine. I just want to say that at the very outset of the work that we began two years ago, I was on contest rocketry. And I supplied email contact directly to me. Contest Rock. That down. Contest Rock is a private forum that has nothing to do with the NAR. Contest Rock is a bunch of people who want to complain. has nothing to do with the NAR okay. or Contest Rock. Period. Okay. Contest Rock is made up by somebody in his basement. I don't care. What about the rest of us? There's 5,000 members. 
and eight people can decide the course of Clinton's directory. Is, is, there, is there an answer to my question? Is there an answer? Am I am I completely off the off okay. base, or is there an issue here? The NARC doesn't host any free for all forum. That's correct. Right. They, they would have yeah, we, them to create something brand new. Who made the pink book? How many people made the pink book 20 years ago? Five, eight people? Years ago. Eight people? Actually, yeah. 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 Was it voted on? Was it just accepted? Was it ever voted on? Was it ever? Was the? Was it just okay? There's the pink book. Is that how it works? Yes. It's voted on by the, the board of directors. The board, who sits in a room with a locked door. Who are elected by the members of the board. Who elected us to do? I do want to correct one thing. It is not a locked door. As John said earlier, when they're in executive session, yes, it is a locked door. But the vast part of board meetings is not a locked door. Anybody can okay. walk in. All I can say is there's, it, uh, there seems to be an impression that, S, that the SQ production has not had much discussion. Mm -hmm. We provided 90 day opportunity to input us. Input. 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 To us input. That's correct. Other yeah. Okay. Other I guess that's what okay. we're I've already made my vote. It says sport flyer. I've got a, another question on the same topic, I guess. Uh, what's what's the current percentage of any of our members that are involved in competition? About two or three percent, maybe? Yeah. How many of the 97% of the NER members that are not involved in competition were talked to to find out why they're not and what it would take to get them involved? I have another to refine. So I don't know how to answer your the, question, the Bob. Who used to go in and do competition and are no longer doing competition, asking them why they're not doing competition. I'm sorry, I don't if know you what answered me, I didn't hear it. I don't have an answer for you, Bob. Thank you. Other? Yes, ma'am. John, you mentioned flight ticket. Um, we are out of the field all week, hopefully between the hours of 10 and 3. Thursday, and we'll leave a little bit early. Um, anybody who has people in the area they want to send out, we are down at the, con uh, at the sport range. I have 60-some oh, rockets left to give away. Um, <laughs> So it's any any person 12 years old or younger, or any first time flyer of any age. So they get a rocket, they get an engine, they get to fly. Yeah. Are there any other? Um, you were asking about sections. My section closed this last year. Uh, we had five members, we lost one, we were down to four. Um, out of those four, two of us were competition. Now my question is, is that we support over 3,000 kids in the Kansas City area between three volunteers. We had six weeks of weekends where we're doing nothing but scout flying. I had no contact from the norm about why we were closing our section. Why is that? I mean, we're out there, we're doing outreach. We're talking to students. We had we launched a thousand rockets in six hours for one school. And nobody, nobody, we we decided to close because nobody contacted us with as few people as we did. We have just been we felt like we were left in the mortgage. I'm not offering this as an excuse. I don't know why you weren't contacted. I, I'm, 
even but but did you attempt to contact Lenar and ask for help or we felt like we've been ignored. But the how entire time. No, but, it's, but it's, how do we it's know? Not just, it's not just about us reaching out to you and asking for help. It's also you contacting us and asking us for information. It's just like with what's going on with Bonnie and We were not contacted. And I feel like my section would have a lot more students, a lot more people that are not transitioning over from a first-time flyer into constant NAR members. And I have no information on how to do it. And I'm asking people, local people that I know, because I know very few people on the board, but, and but asking for help from the people that I know to try and grow. We never grew. But, but we have contact. We, I mean, president it, at, at NAR.org, I mean, all our contact information is displayed on the NAR contacts pages. But it still ends up being the situation where we're not getting anybody transferring from any of those student initiatives, any of those scout initiatives, into becoming NAR members. Okay. And that's why we died off. I was the youngest member, and I'm 39 years old. Everybody else was 59 or older in my section. And we could not grow. So we just felt like that's it. We're tired. We're volunteering all the time. And we got no support. So we resigned the section. My question is, my big question is, why did nobody contact us? When did you sign the Can I speak? I mean, he, he mentioned before, feel your emotion. I, feel, I, I sympathize for your situation. I'm great woman outreach, but he had a bullet up point up there. Everyone up there except one person is a volunteer. So I think, you know, it's, to me it's a little bit, ask not what your NAR can do for you, but what you can do for your NAR to a certain extent. Get involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a membership need director. You need help. Let them go. But but hey, I mean, do you have any ideas for us? What's worked elsewhere? It's a. It's got to be a two-way street. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with you on that. That it is. That it is partially my fault. But it's also the fact that we felt like that we had what. I mean, how many contests, how many regionals did we have in our section of the last five years? We had four, and only one other section, two sections came out of how many years? We, and we have one person from each of those sections. One from St. Louis, one from the other side of the <laughs> and that was it. So, um, at the risk of being stung to death here, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's okay to say no to those outreach opportunities, right? There may not be. Okay, that's, 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 that's mm -hmm. one point that I'd like to make, right? For example, we were approached by a scout leader who wanted to do uh, a launch that would involve more kids than we thought our small group of people, which by the way was bigger than yours, and you had more people to fly than we were being told we had to fly. We didn't think we could support that much. So we declined that opportunity, even though it would have given us exposure to a much broader potential set of members. So there, there are times that I would say the sections who are stretched, or feeling stressed, or burned out, it's okay to say no. Bit off too much. And then the, the, the question I have for you is, what are you doing about your rocket flying now? If you've disbanded your section, where are you flying rockets? Um, we still we still have the same park that's available. It's is uh, provided by the, the uh, local community, and they don't require you to carry the insurance or. They have their own when you fly. I that. see. Okay. So we can use ours. Yeah. And so it it may you know it, it made no sense for us to to continue. If, you know, and it's free membership. 
it's a free license for us to go and fly that. The other rule that I might apply to these situations in terms of setting our expectations realistically, for many years, the Naira section did a make it take it at the National Hobby Show that was in Chicago for many years. And we would build upwards to a thousand rockets. Two thousand. Or two thousand in some cases, yes. I remember how my feet fell at the end of that week. Um, the, uh, and then we would tell the kids, okay, now you finish your rocket. Here's a map dark coming field. Uh, here's, we have a launch next week. We'll give you a free engine if you show back up and come fly with us. And out of those thousand kids, if we got even 50 of them to show up, we thought that was a big deal, right? And then we would have material ready for them at that launch to say, oh, here's how you become a member of our club. It costs you a grand sum, $3 a year to be a member of this club. And we have regular launches and meetings, yada, yada, yada. If we got one of those 50 kids, one of them to sign up, that was, that was pretty good, right? So I have this mantra that says, every step you ask people to make more and more commitment, you lose 99 percent. Right. The thousand goes to 100. The 100 goes to 10. Right. You have to keep that in mind in terms of even though you may be hitting lots and lots and lots of people, we might be America's 87th most popular hobby. Not that high. I'd be impressed. So, that. I know that doesn't help. Maybe you not even that high. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe 870. Yeah. But. Those are sort of the raw facts of trying to recruit these kids who are involved in scouting and baseball and basketball and, you know, a band mm -hmm. and all, all this other stuff. So the, the thing is, it's not the kids' fault. It's Absolutely the parents. They're making choices about where they think their kids' activity and interest is, and, and that's what you have to do as parents. So the university is I believe if you, in my opinion, it was great. <laughs> Target the adults. Get information out to the adults about rocket trains. Some of them may be warning in rocket rocketeers, but the parents are the ones that's going to drive it, not the kids. If the parents are involved, the parents are excited, they're going to bring the kids along. So when you have these big events, are you, are you talking to the parents? What, what are they? Oh, absolutely. What, what do right. they want? To, are they just not interested? I mean, they can't. At, at some of the launches where they're low fiber rockets, when they're done, they can step in the garbage. And they, we've covered hundreds of rockets like that. Okay, I got a couple other. Back, back to the bigger point of this question was you know, you have this in your data, like you talk about a number of people that are members of sections, a pretty great example of losing a section. What mechanism exists in an organization whereby a charter section for I don't know how many years disappears? What follow up is there yeah. to say why did we lose this section? Who can we contact? What's is there any sort of mechanism there? Maybe the section activities committee could monitor more closely the activities of the sections, and when they see membership dropping in a year or less regionals, less participation, it could trigger something with them. There's 174 sections. I don't know how many people are on the committee, but they could each have a certain percentage that they cover and look one. at that a committee of one. It's a committee of one. <laughs> that could be, you know. Something, um, I could be off on this. You know, I haven't competed in 18 years. All I do is show up at Narrow and take pictures. But I'm seeing a trend in some of the wording that's being spoken at this meeting. I think I see where part of the problem is. Mr. Harkheimer, how many people are at headquarters in there? How many people compose the operating personnel in the NAR? One. One. Point five. Okay. Yeah. So basically, the number of red shirts. No, 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 no. I mean, the volunteers. There are no volunteers at headquarters. Headquarters is in Marion, Iowa. The, the, the board, the committees. How many people are we talking about? Oh. Well, the board is nine people. The board is nine people. Okay, and what, maybe a dozen in committees? Okay, there is no NAR organization. It, there, there, we're not talking about Walmart with a thousand employees and lawyers and teams. We're talking about a number of people you can count on your two hands. No, there's, there's about a limit 50, to what no, they can do. There's probably about 50 volunteers within the NAR. The L3CC along, alone has over 30 people on it. But that's just the L3C thing. Well, no, but the point is you also have the various standing committees 
You have several people on, on the contest board. You have multiple people on standards and testing. Well, what my point is, it's not a magical, massive organization that just sees all these problems and go, oh, send the team out to fix that problem. It just doesn't exist. So we either have to build it or we have to adapt and work around it. That's why it's volunteer-based. I don't know. Did the I don't know your names. Yeah. <laughs> I can't yeah. just, but Flight. Um, Flight. Flight. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to your question of do we monitor that? I will find out. Um, it's my impression in talking with Chuck, I think we do. Now, we may not be wholly effective at monitoring it, but Chuck Neff, the, the volunteer that, that interacts with the voice <coughs> sections, is doing a ton of work trying to reach out and, and help sections. And if if you contacted him and got nothing, I, I would be dumbfounded. I, I, I don't, I I don't think I got into contact with him. Did you so, contact him or you said he didn't get in touch with you? Either way. I, I, there, was, there was a breakdown in communication is, is, what I'm, is really what I'm going after is that it, it's on both sides. There was a breakdown in communication. And that's that's a major problem. And that's my question is, what are we going to do as an organization to resolve that? So I'm telling you, the first step that I'm going to do is go back and talk to Chuck and see, find out more of what he is doing on a, a very regular basis. But I'm also going to talk to him and all the section activities. And you know, at some point, we're going to find out who our new elected people are in there and we're going to re assign committee duties on the, the board and whoever's assigned to section activities, this is going to be one of the things that, that they need to take on. Why are we not communicating more with our sections if, if this is a, a major problem for a section like yours and, and some others? So, it's the best we can do right now. I, and I, I will get back to you with um, you know, what I found from Chuck and, and get them in contact with you. And I wasn't trying to be critical of any of the committee members or anything. It was just this communication wasn't made, this wasn't responded to. How, you know, a suggestion, this was just a suggestion as to something that we might be able to do to improve that. I, I totally appreciate it. And, I, and I'll tell you all, I got a thick skin. <laughs> I have a job that makes this look like the cake. All right. All right. So, um, yeah. I'm a volunteer, your board are volunteers, we're trying to do the best we can to help you, we're trying to do the best we can to make contests better, we're falling short in some parts of it, we're trying to do the best we can to get the word out to get people to vote, we're trying to save money by not mailing 6,000 pieces of mail that 5,900 of them never get opened or whatever, you know, so we're trying lots of things to save money and do the best we can. Right? Um, we don't, we don't succeed 100% of the time, but give us feedback and, and tell us how we can help and be constructive, and we'll try our best to, to right the situation. And that's all we can do, and that's all I can promise. Are there any other things? I'd like to tell Blake a quick story if I might. Uh, my father was a scoutmaster for 35 years, and he earned the Silver Beaver Award and put in his top of it. And uh, we camped in Tank River for you know dozens of years in a row. And uh, well, he did anyway. And my brother and my father invented the uh, model building merit badge. And the way to earn that merit badge was to build a rocket, fly a rocket at scout camp all these years. And that merit badge eventually turned into space exploration merit badge. Okay, so we didn't even know the NAR existed back in the mid 70s. We were just flying rockets for fun all those years. And uh, I don't know what your avenue is to put your club out there to be recognized, but a lot of clubs have websites and so on. And our club was contacted by the Muscatello Council two weeks before this NARI. And me and my wife single-handedly went out to our field and entertained 80 people, 50 kids and 30 adults, to fly rockets. And we pulled it off and it was extremely fun and we did it all out of the goodness of our heart and didn't expect one penny and they donated us $250.
So, two weeks before the election. I'm going to come back to the point that I had. Uh, I don't know if any of you who have dealt with camps have heard of Camp Nash. Camp Nash is one of the largest scout camps in the nation, and it's based just outside of Kansas City. They had one of the most amazing fields that I've ever flown on. And we were out there at 6 o'clock in the morning, didn't leave until 9 o'clock at night, Oof. helping all of these kids go out and fly the truck. And you know, I loved every instance of it. I loved it all. It's, it's why I do what I do. I, I feel like this is almost a full-time volunteer, a full-time job for me outside of my job. I love it that much. But it's, it's one of those things that you kind of get to the point where it's like, you know, we're throwing spaghetti on the wall and nothing's sticking. And I'm not finding another way or a different way or a better way of getting that spaghetti to stick. It doesn't. I'll be honest, it doesn't. My experience working with scout organizations, they are one of the worst organizations for us to recruit members. It, it, this was the first year that we did it with the scouts. Okay, but the experience is if you were expecting them to be signing up for your organization in droves, not going to happen. As Bunny's experience is, okay, the scouts, they have a mission to go do a space exploration. If it's Boy Scouts, they want to do an exercise to expose the kids to different activities. You're just one of many activities. If you happen to gain a member or interest in the process, thumbs up. But it's, uh, it's avoid disappointment. Kind of Aim low. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's also true. kind of the same thing with the schools yeah. that we've exactly. ended up. They have to do, yeah. and then they're done. Yeah. Yeah. Any it's other? Uh, thank you. Um, so I have all, all my cheat notes on my hand. Yeah, this school, right? So um, if there's nothing else, uh, I'd like to call the business meeting to order. And Joyce, do we have a quorum? How do we know we have a quorum? We have 25 members here. I think we have 25 <laughs> members here because we had 50 people vote. There you go. Tonight. Yeah, but Kaplan yes. voted a few times. <laughs> <laughs> So would, you like the election? would you like the election results then? Yeah. Okay. Yes, election results in order of number of votes. John Hockheimer, 89 votes. Uh, Kevin Johnson, 76 votes. Randy Bodeway, 69 votes. And John Thompson, 54 votes. So there's a pretty good spread between all four of them. It's, um, and the, the three new trustees, the three, well, one re-elected John, and two new, are Randy Bodeway and Kevin Johnson. Thank you, Joyce. Um, any business from the floor? And where are you at? Good. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you all.